But if it's true that the physical grows out of the mental, essentially, then I don't see why an individual consciousness would be dependent on a physical brain, because in fact, the physical world is growing out of consciousness. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Dr. Jim Tucker on the show. Dr. Jim Tucker is a child psychiatrist and the Bonner Lowry Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He is director of the UVA Division of Perceptual Studies, where he is continuing the work of Dr. Ian Stevenson on reincarnation. He's been invited to speak about his research on Good Morning America, Larry King Live, and CBS Sunday Morning. And he recently published the book called Before, Children's Memories of Previous Lives, a two-in-one edition of his previous books. This is a really fascinating episode, folks. In this episode, I talked to Dr. Jim Tucker about the science of reincarnation. Yes, there is a science behind this. We delve into his research findings and methodology on children who claim to remember their prior lives. Dr. Tucker notes that these children don't just recall biological details of their past, but they also retain feelings and emotions. His findings have important implications for how we understand consciousness. We also touch on the topics of morality, trauma, quantum physics, and panpsychism. The implications of this really run deep, and while there's still a lot of questions that remain, I had a lot of fun chatting with Dr. Tucker about what's possible. I hope you enjoy this episode just as much as I do. So now I bring you Dr. Jim Tucker. Really nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. I am utterly fascinated with your work and don't know why it's not more mainstream, quite frankly. There's uh, so many implications of it for so many areas of cognitive science that I study. Um, And it it runs deep to consciousness, issues of consciousness, issues of um, even um, uh, free will. You know, so there's so much to discuss. Well, that's right. But uh, yeah, it's not more mainstream because it challenges a lot of the uh, sort of mainstream assumptions. Mm. Uh, so it's easy for people to ignore it. Yeah. So well, before we jump into the deep end, I, I wanted to get a sense of some of your biggest influences. I do get the sense that Dr. Ian Stevenson um, played a huge role in, in your work and even to the extent that you're kind of carrying the baton like i like to think i'm carrying the baton from abraham maslow you're carrying the baton uh from dr ian stevenson so if you talk a little about his work and uh and uh, the work he initiated in like 1958 i believe right so yeah he came to uva in the late 50s to be chairman of the department of psychiatry and and had never done any had he had an interest in parapsychology but he had never done any um And he was still in his late 30s when he came here to be chair. I mean, he's having quite a successful mainstream career, mostly or much of it looking at psychosomatic kinds of things. Um, But then he he got intrigued by this phenomenon of young children in different parts of the world who said that they had memories of a past life. And um, he started trying to investigate those cases and and find out exactly what the child said and, and whether they, in fact, matched a life from the past. His work, Ian um, once said on the obsessive compulsive scale of one to 10, he was an 11 and he liked to get all the details right. So he was, he was very methodical in uh, studying these cases and eventually stepped down as chairman of the department to focus full time on them and and then spent the bulk of the next few decades uh, studying these cases. and, And we've continued to do that. So, Dr. Ian Stevenson, yeah. So that's that's interesting. I didn't know that he he would score high in uh, OCD. So he was really. Do you get the sense from from reading his writings that he really wasn't biased to a certain conclusion? That he really wanted to amass as much evidence as possible to before he made up his mind. You know, I don't even know if he ever made up his mind completely. But yeah, do, do you get that sense that he really wanted to get as much data as possible? Yeah, he. Um, I mean, he was basically trying to determine for himself. So, yeah, as we all are, I mean, we're, we're research questions are ones that we're questioning. Um, mm. In his case, he had become persuaded that the strongest cases that that reincarnation was the best explanation for them, but not the only. Uh, so he certainly left that door open that, that he could be wrong about it. But he was uh, persuaded that, you know, there was people no longer had to accept reincarnation on faith, they could accept it on evidence if they chose to. 
Well, he coined the term psychophore, right? Yeah. P S Y C H O P H O R E, soul bearing. What was his thought about that? Why did he find the need to coin such a term? Well, right. So he was, his idea was that if he had these uh, memories and emotions and behavioral characteristics in a life, that if they continued on into another life, as, as these cases appear to suggest, then there would have to be some sort of vehicle to carry them. Uh, so rather than use a term like soul or spirit, you know, some sort of religious term, he felt that he should coin a new term that, that didn't have connotations that were not necessarily consistent with the work or certainly not consistent with the attempt to look at this in sort of a serious objective way as opposed to, to a religious way. Mm, yeah. Yeah, because even just people listening to this conversation, even they're like, oh, they're talking about reincarnation. Reincarnation, it might be hard for people to even have a model in their head that one can discuss this in a scientific way. So we're going to let's change some people's minds here today in the sense that we can show them that we can have this discussion in a, in a, in a, in a way that is evidence based. Uh, and so, Doc, what I find interesting is Dr. Stevens, he has this quote. Reincarnation is the best, even though not the only explanation for the stronger cases we have investigated. That was the 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 quote that that got to the closest when I wanted to know what his conclusion was. And you're not Ian Stevens; you're your own human. So, um, as a jumping point from that, I want to you know continue the rest of this conversation today on what you've discovered and what you've concluded, uh, maybe have similarly and differently from Doctor Ian Stevenson, even though he was a huge mentor of yours. So you kind of popped on the scene in 1996, <laughs> on the reincarnation scene. You reincarnated in 1996. Yeah. You let, right, you left your private practice in psychiatry to go all in on this. So this was this was this was a motivation. Like you, there was a moment, like a Howard Gardner calls it a crystallizing experience, right? Where you you're like, this is it. This is what I want to do with my life moving forward. Um, so how did that happen? Yeah, it was a real fork in the road that, for sure. Um, and, and I think. I mean, to back up for a step, it, it basically, the, the big fork in the road, when my wife and I got together, it, it opened me up to, um, I mean, to be frank, to experiencing life in sort of a different way, a more fuller way, or, or a fuller mm -hmm. way. And um, she was open to these kinds of things in a way that I had not been. So that got me intrigued. So I was reading about different things, and I was actually reading one of Ian Simpson's books, uh, when I learned that his research division here at the University of Virginia had gotten a grant to do a new study on near-death experiences, not reincarnation, but new death experiences. Uh, so I just called them up to see if they needed help with that study. And, and sort of one thing led to another. Um, but, but when I left my private practice to come on here, uh, I have continued to be a child psychiatrist. So uh, about half of my time roughly is spent doing clinical work, patient care work, uh, helping to train the residents and the fellows. So it's, it's not like I left it all behind, but I did decide that um, I was going to do the work that I wanted to do. And, you know, if it didn't work out, I could always go back into private practice. But, but in the meantime, I, I was going to explore this area. Again, I mean, the question of life after death is something that, you know, interests all of us, at least to some extent. But, but what really appealed to me was the, um, serious minded sort of uh, scientific approach, evidence based approach that, that was going on uh, at UVA and, and that I wanted to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, it must have also felt a little bit like a, a, re a rebel, right? Like there must be some bone in your body that, like, you know, maybe like just a personality trait you maybe have had your whole life where you're like, you know, like I'm going to, you know, take on the establishment a little bit. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm quite the opposite. Um, I've always fascinating, fascinating. Pretty much a straight arrow rule follower kind of person. Um, so yeah, it, it was a step out of my comfort zone. But but, but again, hmm. the approach is mainstream. I mean, it, it's yeah, looking at it's, it's looking at a topic that people don't usually apply these methods to. But but it's the, the same end goal of, of seeing what we can. To seeing what we can discover. Yeah, I mean, I bet you see all sorts of explanations for things that that make you roll your eyes. You know, like that are just so outside of the evidence base. 
And you're like, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the evidence <laughs> suggests that's true at all. But here's a fact, a fascinating fact. Some young children say they have been here before. Okay, that's the fact. Now, what derives from that? Well, lots of things um, can be investigated to try to understand that. And the and and you probably always get asked, well, what's the mechanism? What's the mechanism? Right? And there's all sorts of explanations. I would like to go through in a systematic way um, and discuss, um, first of all, the main characteristics that you see. Um, and we'll go through it. I have the list. And then I also want to discuss some of the potential explanations for it. And then I want to end with your your thoughts on what's 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 going on based on the totality of the evidence. So one thing you often see are uh, just the most simplest, uh, uh, most conceptually associated with with this idea, which is which are past life statements, right? So these kids, um, usually between the ages of two and five, talk about um, a someone else's whole life, right? And they seem to have memories of it, right? So can you elucidate a little bit what exactly the nature of that looks like? Yeah, it, it's very much memory in the sense that it's from one person's point of view. They're not just spouting facts, but more of what to them feel like memories and mm. often focused on the end of the life. So uh, three quarters of the kids talk about how they died in the past life. They remember the death. And um, most of those are, are some sort of violent death. Or, or unnatural death anyway, murder, suicide, accident, combat, that sort of thing. And with those sort of traumatic memories uh, can come other memories too about family. Uh, they, they may express a lot of emotional attachment toward previous parents. They, they may tell their parents, you're not really my parents, but my parents live in such and such place. And they, at times, will give enough specific details, which pretty much have to include names of places or names of people, but give enough where people then verify that, that their apparent memories do in fact match a life from the past. A lot of them will also show a lot of emotions. Um, I mentioned that the attachment to the previous family, um, many of them will show phobias toward the mode of death uh, the previous person had that the kids may mm -hmm. act out various aspects of the past life in their play. So, it, you know, again, it's not just information that they seem to be connecting to or that seems to have carried on, but but the whole that feelings and emotions have, have carried on as well, it seems. Um, these kids do this spontaneously. It doesn't involve hypnotic regression or anything like that. And they, they come from all over the world that we've studied over 2,500 cases. Um, and while they're easiest to find in cultures with the general belief in reincarnation, uh, they happen everywhere. Uh, so it's, it's with the American cases, most of the parents did not believe in, in past lives before their kids started talking about one. So it's not like anyone created this for or led them uh, to believe these things. It's, it's just something that arises from them. Uh, that they have these emotional memories that they describe. Great. And few of them are famous people. Um, so there's, uh, there, it's not like they're really prominent cases. Would you say that the 100% of these cases can't be explained away by somehow the kid uh, finding a news article, you know, somewhere or watching something on television about about a really violent death of someone. Can you say that you, you have investigated that systematically and 100% of the cases can't be explained away by that? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say 100% for anything, but it, but in the strongest mm -hmm. cases, um, for instance, some of the kids will talk about either a, a deceased family member or yeah. a deceased person from the same town or, or village. So those, mm -hmm. you know, you always wondered, did they learn about the, the previous person right. by natural means? But but with the stranger cases, I mean, there where they remember being a stranger, there are plenty of those where it, it's essentially inconceivable that they learned about this stuff through normal means. Now there may be other explanations for the cases, but not that they somehow read a news article about this person who lived fifty years before and that you know died in in um, um, without anyone knowing about them, I mean, that, that that's just not a, a reasonable explanation for most of them. Fascinating. And, you know, 
children have wild imaginations, right? Um, and you have enough people on earth, you know, I could, I bet I could imagine something right now. And then statistically, it probably would match up to some, you know, I could make up something right now, be like, um, I'm Johnny, uh, I'm Johnny who um, uh, died of a, of a bullet to the head in the war. I bet there's someone named Johnny who died with a bullet head of the war. So just, it, just statistically. Now, do you think that can fully explain it as a rich, rich imagination that just happens to match um, uh, a prior life? Well, it depends on the statement. So, yeah, like you said, or, you know, if someone says, I was Bob and I was killed in a car accident in California. All right. Well, they're going to be a lot. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, so you have to look at how the specificity of the statements. So there yeah, are a lot of them specific. where it can only fit one person. Wow. Um, so, you know, there's a well-known American case of, of a kid who talked about being a World War II pilot uh, who was shot uh, in the Pacific and gave the name of, of the uh, aircraft carrier, first and last name of a friend of his, described where he died, described how, how he died. And there was only one person in history uh, whose life matched those details. So, you know, you could say it's a coincidence, uh, but that I don't think is plausible. I mean, that, that would be one heck of a coincidence one have a, yeah one heck of a coincidence and you tend to find that these individuals come from not necessarily the person's bloodline but so, a certain uh, vicinity to where they live right you don't tend to have prior lives of someone on the other end of the world that's true although we do occasionally get those reports and yeah, you know, if a child, mm -hmm. if an American child says my last life was in Africa, well, I mean, there's no way to verify that without a whole lot more details. Uh, but with the ones that do have verifiable details, um, even the ones who describe a past life as a member of, of a, um, another country, there was often a geographical connection. So for instance, Burmese children who said they were Japanese soldiers killed in Burma during World War II. Um, so, right. Most of them are not related. They're not uh, describing the life of an ancestor. So there's not a genetic connection, but there is, um, it is for intact memories to come through. Typically the past life was one that was reasonably close by, usually in the same country. And then you also tend to see some past life behaviors, uh, like unusual play among these children. Um, can you kind of elaborate what you see there? Yeah. The most common is actually acting out the previous occupation. Um, mm. So, I mean, not just playing war like all kids do, but specific things like a kid who, who played repeatedly for hours on mm. end at being a, a, a biscuit and soda shopkeeper, uh, which the previous mm. person had done. Some of them will, sh will kind of reenact the death scene uh, over and over. That's not as common as the occupation, but we do have some of those cases. Um, but, but sometimes the occupation ones are, are quite um, precise as well. Uh, so there's this kid who remembered being a nightclub owner and would even put out seats for his two wives. And, and it turned out that the previous person was somebody who, who fit that kind of description. Um, so just taken on its own, the play may not necessarily be that impressive, but when you put it in with the whole picture, then then it, it looks like it is connected to the memories the child has. That's a great point, and I, I should have stepped back and asked about your methodology because it is true that when you collect these reports, you tend to uh, further investigate ones that show two out of a list of behaviors that there, there are multiple of these things. Uh, that When I was reading into your methodology, is that, is that correct? Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. There are a number of features that we look for the most obvious is um, claiming to remember a past life. But mm -hmm. then, yeah, there are behaviors that are associated, appear associated with the memories. There are, these are not common, but there are cases where the previous person made a prediction about where they would be born the next time around. Um, there are also what we call announcing dreams where usually the mom, when she's pregnant, will have a dream about a previous person saying, I'm coming to be born to you. Um, and it seems like there are one or two other features that, that make the list for you. We have to have at least two of those to register it in our cases. Oh, birthmarks and birth defects that match. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Uh, on the previous person. Uh, so the most common are the statements and the behaviors, but uh, we get the others as well. 
I was I thought thought it was interesting that like in India where reincarnation is a uh, idea that's in the in the in the in the consciousness there of of the culture, uh, a third of your cases from India include birthmarks or birth defects that are thought to correspond to wounds on the previous personalities, with eighteen percent of those including medical records that confirm the match. Oh my gosh, what do you think's going on with the birthmarks? <laughs> Yeah, well, I will say like the child intentionally branded themselves, right? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think we've ruled that out. But I will say the percentage is a little bit misleading in the sense that Ian Stevenson um, was really fascinated by those cases. So those that would affect which ones he would fully investigate. But but yes, there are plenty of those cases out there. And and yeah, it's it's ones where the child is born with with a birthmark or full birth defects that match wounds, usually the fatal wounds on the body of the previous person. Um, And they include like 18 cases where they have both entrance and exit wounds of somebody who was a gunshot victim. Um, Deformities like there was a case of a uh, little boy who, um, uh, the previous boy lost the fingers of his right hand in a fodder chopping machine. And and then the the second boy was then born with with missing the fingers on his right hand. Uh, And there are lots of, of those people out there. Um, we get some American ones like that as well, that they're not as common here, uh, but we've certainly had ones, including a, one with heart defect, um, others with birth wow. marks. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're, it, it seems that if, I mean, if we accept the cases, there, if there is this sort of carryover of, of mind or consciousness, that, that sometimes traumatic either memories or even traumatic wounds uh, can affect the developing fetus in the way that they they show up in the baby. Yeah, you talk about that in the in, in your in one of your books about the fascinating nature of how our mind can affect our bodies. You know how these things are intertwined, and uh, maybe the consciousness uh, creates the the birthmarks. But it, you know, it makes one question. You know, where do birthmarks come from in any of us? Like, I have birthmarks, right? Like, why do I have birthmarks? What's the, what's the developmental explanation for that? Would a would a biologist be able to explain that to me concretely? Well, I think most of them, the, the cause is unknown. Um, I mean, not that I'm an expert on birth marks, but there, you know, there are some birth defects in particular where there's a syndrome that's been identified. But but for most mm-hmm. of them, it's unknown. And you know, it's not necessarily a ton of research on birth marks because they're usually right. benign. Um, and and Ian never claimed that all birth marks were related to past lives, but just that in some of these, I know, uh, but, but I, it makes me wonder. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Tucker, I have a confession. Uh, when I was three years old or so, we were in Disneyland and, uh, we were, I still remember this vividly. I remember this vividly. We're in Disneyland and, uh, we were at the hotel afterwards and I went into the bathroom and I remember I was standing in front of the toilet and suddenly I saw I was like an old man in my head, and I saw my whole life, uh, be, uh, my whole life flash before my eyes. Like I saw, like, like suddenly, like I wasn't three year old Scott. I was literally like a mature old man with like and all the things that come along with that. Like I had lots of mature thoughts, like that a three year old you know w- wouldn't tend to have, and it freaked me out, and uh, so much so that I remember this moment even even today. Um, and I, uh, but it, it just disappeared. It just disappeared when I like walked back into the room. It was just this like yeah. moment, um, where I just, I was, I was, a, I literally felt like I was this old man now. And, and did course, it feel like yeah. you were old man Scott or, I mean, couldn't you tell? Hard to tell, hard, but I still remember it vividly. Like I remember that memory vividly. I mean, that's crazy. Like I was three or four, but I, um, uh, it felt like. Like I was, they're both 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 were in me at the same time. I was the old Scott, be, like knowing everything like that an old man knows and being like, oh gosh, but uh, I have this three year old body that has to like live it live live it through. Like I have to like go through the motions of living a life, but I I see it at the end of the life. I see the whole life mm-hmm. lived. Um, it's the weird, it was the weirdest thing. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it's the kind of thing that, I mean, these experiences do happen to people. And, and yeah. I mean, if, with our cases, we do have some where the child will talk uh, with great emotion about a past life just one time. And then they mm-hmm. parents will ask them about it a week later. They don't even remember. Um, mm-hmm. But then there are others. 
you know, where people will have sort of transcendental experiences, which, you know, as a three-year-old sort of being able to or seemingly stepping back from your day-to-day experience and, and seeing the big picture um, is, is something that happens to people. And, you know, what do we make of that? It sounds like you sort of stepped out of time for, for an instant. Yeah. 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 Just had a very like mature way of, I mean, I wasn't a three-year-old at that moment. You know, mm-hmm. just so it's so uh, it's so interesting. So these are some explanations to consider, um, and I wanted to go through this. There are normal explanations, and then of course there are paranormal explanations. Let's just let's let's start with the normal <laughs> the normal ones. Um, you say, "quote We approach the cases with an attitude of scientific curiosity. We are open to all possibilities." I mean, gosh, what a great scientific um, uh, approach. I wish all scientists had that, that approach, quite frankly. I can't say all do. So normal explanations include things like, well, maybe these kids have fraud. Maybe it's fraud. What would, what would fraud? Uh, it's not like the kids are creating the fraud, but they're broad conditions that make it look like those kids are saying those things, right? Is that is that one of that potential? Yeah, actually, Ian Simpson published a case of, of I mean, published an, a paper on, I think it was seven cases of either deception or self-deception. Um Sometimes, very rarely, where the child's family may be trying to get, say, money out of a, a wealthy family and, and say that, that their child was the previously uh, family member. What's more common, I think, is self-deception, where um, the families may make sort of too much of what of the child's statements and then kind of build this story that, that the child was either a deceased family member in a past life or occasionally famous, a famous person. I mean, I've gotten ones for famous people like Babe Ruth and, and people like that, yeah. which I, I mean, I'm not saying skeptical. the child wasn't Babe Ruth. I'm pretty skeptical. Of it. Well, what do you do? What if we get five kids and they all say that they were Babe Ruth? Do you got to like, they got to fight that out amongst themselves? Like, you know, which is the real one? Yeah. Well, right. So, I mean, that almost never happens with kids, but, but it, we do get some reports from adults who feel like they were, someone famous in the past, often not because they have specific memories, but because of other aspects or coincidence or similarities. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've had a number of Thomas Jefferson's. I I think that's the the leading one, you know, the University of Virginia. And, I mean, the adult cases we we tend to look at with a fairly skeptical eye anyway, because if you don't have specific memories, I I think it's very hard to, to even speculate about who you were in a past life. Uh, but again, I mean, that's a tiny uh, minority of, of these cases. Uh, for the most part, uh, there's no reason to think that the parents or the child, that they're committing deception. And, and uh, typically, there's not even any grounds to think they would be committing self-deception. You actually just made me think of a question, though. Have you ever had two children claim to have memories of the same person, not famous, you know? Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah, there are cases. Um, one of our colleagues, Antonia Mills, up in northern British Columbia, uh, studied cases of, of um, with the uh, tribal peoples up there, and there were there are some communities where uh, they will assign not assign but recognize a child as being a, a past life uh, person on very um, limited grounds. I mean, they say a dream and they may decide, okay, this child was that person. And it's usually like a village elder or somebody that was well-respected in the community. So not a famous person, but somebody that people looked up to. So there may be three or four kids who are all identified as being that person in the past line. But, wow. but again, that that's a real exception to, to real rare, real rare, real rare. Yeah. Um, another potential explanation is, well, we already discussed this one, which is fantasy. Yeah. Um, but I think we already discussed and you kind of you made well, that. Well, yeah, that. I mean, I will say if none of these memories could be verified, then I would have a great belief in the likelihood that this could be fantasy. I mean, kids certainly mm. are capable of fantasy and say all kinds of things. Uh, again, we don't take that at face value. It's whether we can determine that these statements actually matched a past life, but before we th- would think that it's more than just fantasy. Mm, yeah. Um, and then faulty memory by informants. Uh, how much could that explain the findings? 
Right. So the idea is that the child makes some perhaps general statements about a past life, that the family finds someone whose life more or less matched those uh, statements. And then after the families meet and exchange information, then the child gets credited with more information than they actually had. And right. there are certainly cases where that warrants serious consideration. Okay. Um, but then there are all the cases where we've got written documentation of what the child said before anyone knew that there was a previous person. So we can be sure that there's not faulty memory in, in those because we've, we've got written documentation. And then this one is very interesting and for a number of reasons. Gen- genetic memory. Th- this one kind of gets to the heart of a lot of uh, a lot of things that I that I personally study. Our worlds are going are about to intersect in a second. You'll see why. But can you tell me a little bit about what that is? What is genetic memory? Yeah, the, the thought is that the idea is that the memories would be um, transferred in the genes to the child, so it would not be some sort of paranormal kind of thing, but but more a physical uh, transfer through the genes. Um, but that does not explain could not explain most of our cases, partly because most of the time the child is not talking about a direct ancestor, which they would have to be for for the genes to come through. And also, Mm -hmm. most of the children have memories of how they died, which, of course, people die after they've already passed on their genetic material. Um, So, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of very interesting facets to what can be transferred in genes, or at least epigenetically, but what kinds of memories uh, perhaps can be transferred, but but it doesn't seem to be uh, a factor in these cases. Well, hold up, <laughs> sure. hold up. Um, my own area of research. This is where our worlds intersect, and I've long been thinking about this. Um, I've studied prodigies, mm-hmm. and I've studied savants, and uh, I'm very dear friends with um, a man named Daryl Treffer, who passed away pretty recently, um, and he was. He was the scientific advisor to the movie Rain Man, but he was mm. also um, ha- the most uh, knowledgeable, um, well-known um, scientist studying savants. Um, and he had this idea of genetic memory. He thought that was the only explanation. He thought that was the best explanation for how a lot of these individuals with very low IQs even um, could sit down and uh, paint something photorealistic or sit down at the piano and play something uh, amazing. And even in the the prodigies realm, there, there's a lot of trying to understand how children under the age of 10 can just have a fully formed talent. Uh, you know, it, it takes a little bit of practice, but it doesn't take that much input <laughs> for them yeah. to learn. Yeah. It's not like um, the parents are pushing these kids. It's the kids are pushing the parents. And then I've studied at great length the idea of gifted children and the idea of, of prodigies. Um, and my friend David Henry Feldman wrote a book about prodigies. And in specifically in there, he noted that there seemed to be a higher than greater chance of these kids somewhere in their ancestry, there was someone who had a talent that re- resembled it. And he didn't rule out the possibility uh, that there was some sort of genetic memory. Mm-hmm. So genetic memory have, has been brought into the discussion of these other domains like prodigies and and savants. I didn't know. I don't know if you're familiar with any of these two individuals that I've mentioned or their work or writings about this, but I'd love to bring all these worlds together because I think there's something really, really, uh, there's something going on. Yeah. <laughs> there's something going on. Yeah. And I mean, I don't doubt that at all. Um, and it may be, it's conceivable that there's a genetic uh, disposition to recalling past lives. I and mean, they, they do seem more common in, in some um, communities than others. But, you know, my point is for the memory to one specific life, um, I don't see how that could be happening through genetic transfer in these cases because they're recalling lives that were is not an ancestor. But, you know, if you consider these children to be well, savants or, or whatever, they have this special ability. Now, it, it may well be that that special ability um, may have a genetic component to it. Yeah, it it gets it gets really um you know it gets it starts to get metaphysical, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not trying to go out all ancient aliens out on on this and be like, could it be that the Shaka record has all these things and that we're tapping into? Now I'm not going, I'm 
I'm not, not that guy. I actually was on an episode of Ancient Aliens, um, but I wasn't. I was the scientist, no. and I made some very clear factual statements about um, where genius comes from. Uh, the whole episode was where does genius come from, mm. and I and I made some statement like, well, we can't reduce genius entirely to the brain. And then the guy with the big hair said, what he means is, <laughs> could it be that it's from the Ashokic record? <laughs> So I mean, that's not what you meant. <laughs> that's not what I meant. Um, but, but I think that, um, you know, I, I think at this point in our conversation, it'd be fun to play around in the space of what, what's the, what is possible? What, what is going on now? Of course there are, I didn't mention the paranormal explanations, extrasensory perception has been one that has been put forward. Um, but as you know, that doesn't explain the birthmarks possession. Um, I'm fascinated with that one as well. I, you know, you look at, uh, you know, people who, uh, who, who do get, feel like they're possessed by the devil, for instance, you know, and then you start to look at those cases more scientifically. You see there's mental illness, mm -hmm. schizophrenia aspects that are, that are, are more reasonable explanations than they were just possessed by the devil. It's not as cut and dry as that they were just possessed by the devil. Um, and then, um, and then of course the paranormal explanation of reincarnation. Um, and you say, um, uh, that doesn't explain fully why the memory is so fleeting, for instance. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, for remaining uh, moments here, let's, let's really play in the space of what is going on, Dr. <laughs> Jim Tucker? Let's just get right down to, to it. You know, what could be going on in a way that, that science can explain someday? I mean, maybe we don't have the tools yet. Maybe that's, that's part of the problem. Yeah, I think um, there are anomalies that in order to explain them, you don't... Um, start over with science, but you may have to sort of broaden uh, some things. So, you know, just like quantum theory, broaden classical physics. And not that I'm saying this is like quantum theory, but um, you can't just, if you accept these cases, you can't just map them on to a materialist understanding of, of reality because they involve some sort of transfer of mind, even if you don't accepted as reincarnation, but some sort of transfer separate from the physical. Um, and taking sort of a larger view, uh, as, as time has gone on, I've become more of a, a um, scientific or phil philosophical idealist. The, the idea that ultimately consciousness is at the core of, of reality and the physical grows out of it. And there are people a lot smarter than me, like Max Planck, the founder of quantum theory, who said the same thing, that, that um, ultimately thing, uh, reality comes down to consciousness. And that can be sort of a mind-bending thing. It can be hard to sometimes to kind of make sense of it. But if it's true that the physical grows out of the mental, essentially, then I don't see why an individual consciousness would be dependent on a physical brain because in fact the physical world is growing out of consciousness so it would make sense that this piece of consciousness or mind that each of us has can continue on regardless of what happens to the physical body we're inhabiting and then in our cases at least i, I have never said it's universal but in our cases at least it seems that this mind has then attached to a new physical body and, and then continued on with a new mind so are you are you literally, literally saying that you think the only way to fully explain the totality evidence is one where we're, we're going to have to disassociate the mind from uh, or consciousness from uh, the physical brain in some capacity, in some way? Yeah, I mean, if you accept these cases, then yes, I, I think you're pretty much forced to conclude that. Um, and, you know, each person can decide for themselves whether they should accept the cases. But I think if you look at our strongest ones as a group, I mean, they do provide good evidence that something's going on here, that they, these children do actually have memories of, of a life from the past. I mean, there's so many deep implications of this if this is, if this is true. Um, but what I want to really understand is why they're so fleeting. Why the memory so fleeting? Why don't people when they uh, get reincarnated, just get reincarnated as the total person uh, for the rest of their life. Um, it, 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 could it, there be mechanisms at play where it, that's just the way, like when you have a human psychology of, of immediate memories, it just inhibits 
past life memories, like that there's a huge conflict there and the way the biological system reconciles that conflict is by, by, um, you know, by prioritizing the, the current, uh, immediate experience. Yeah. I mean, uh, typically these kids lose these memories or most of these memories, uh, at the same time that all kids lose memories of early childhood. Uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, uh, infantile amnesia, or early childhood amnesia, where, as I'm sure you know, the, the, the brain is undergoing tremendous changes during this period of a lot of pruning and, um, you know, memories and sometimes skills or whatever sort of get left behind because others get prioritized. It would make sense that, that for most of these kids, they lose those memories at the same time they lose memories of early childhood. Um, now, another related question is why there's such glimpses, why, you know, like you said, it's not like suddenly they remember everything from the past life. You know, the person hasn't just continued on. It's, it's, it's almost more like when you wake up and you've got glimpses of a dream and sometimes you remember a lot of details and then other times you've got kind of images, but it's pretty hard to put them together and, and you know, they can fade. That's how it is for some of these kids that they will come out with certain details at certain times, but it's not like they can suddenly spout out uh, the, the whole past life. Uh, so it, it's, I mean, it's amazing that any memories would come through, right? Um, but it's, yeah. it's, um, it's usually not a full, complete thing, but it really varies from child to child. So do you think it's, is, what, does your gut tell you that, that we're all reincarnated from, from some assemblage of prior things outside of our own genetic ancestry? Or do you think there are only special cases um, like the ones you're discovering? Um, so not, uh, there's so many questions to be <laughs> asked about this. That's one. I'll stop there. Yeah, well, I, I feel like our cases, again, do provide evidence that there can be this continuation. Uh, and I think that, I mean, I'm speculating, but I, I think that would apply to all of us. But it doesn't mean that all of us have lived here before or that we would be reborn here in this reality. Um, you know, if consciousness is the core of all. I don't know why we couldn't have very different kinds of experiences in very different kinds of realities. Um, so my own personal guess is that reincarnation is not universal in the sense that we all come back here, but that that mind or consciousness, there is a piece that does continue on for all of us. What do you think happens after we die? Well, I don't know that it's universal. I mean, I don't know that we all have the same experience. I think uh, that there are probably a lot of factors that go into uh, what we experience next. And for some, it may be immediately coming back here. Uh, but for others, it may be very different. And, you know, if you look at near-death experiences, uh, people who where their hearts stop and, and then they have these experiences, there can be real variability. I mean, there are similarities, but there can also be real individual differences. And, and I suspect that that is true uh, for any of the afterlife kinds of uh, experiences. Well, what if you want to like increase the chances that you're going to live after you die? Should you die a violent death? I mean, is that what your research suggests? Um I mean, that's what it suggests. No, <laughs> that you should have some dramatic ending. Make sure you have a dramatic <laughs> ending, folks. Well, but to have the memories come through, that may well be true. But, you know, it's just like traumatic memories in this life. I mean, there are memories when people have PTSD, memories that they wish they didn't have, but they couldn't get rid of them. Uh, there, there's a real strength, unfortunately, to traumatic memories. And that may well be the case across lifetimes. Um, wow. Wow. But as far as the kind of experience you have next, I mean, I would guess that it relates to the kind of experiences you have here and, and also the kind of uh, life that you lead. Uh, I mean, not in a heaven and hell kind of sense, but just if you're focused on love and connecting with others and giving to others, you know, it seems to me that would affect your whatever it is that survives. And if we, if we call it a soul, that, that would have a, a an effect on your soul and, and then would affect what comes next. 
Well, this is the, right. I, I'm a scientist, and I and I really am curious uh, what patterns you found among the all. The, if you look at all the people, uh, all the cases of the past lives, and you look at the like, I'm a personality psychologist. I want to like do the. I want to crunch the numbers, like of the big five personality traits. Is there are there certain characteristics that they all have in common? Is there some like I feel like we can like get this mystery like this would this would get us to the like this this is real deep stuff if we can discover who what personality traits are more likely to make you live on after you die I mean that's that's some pretty heavy stuff there <laughs> well, that's right. well we are doing a study now where we are interviewing adults so we originally studied as children because this work's been going on so long and we are administering big five questionnaires to them perfect uh, we haven't gotten where we're, we're done with the analysis yet but we'll see if anything comes from that I mean my my guess is, again, there's a difference between having memories versus surviving at all. Um, I would be disappointed if it turns out certain personalities survive while others don't, you know, per certain personality, people with personality characteristics. But who knows? We'll, we'll have to see where the uh, where the data leads but, us, I guess. But wait, I think we might be talking about different things. I'm not talking about the big five traits of the the person who is alive right now as an adult. I'm talking about what are the common characteristics of all the past lives? Like what's the person you can do that analysis, right? Of the, I mean, you can't physically administer the big five to them, but I'm saying you can do the qualitative sort of impressions. Like are they, are these, do these tend to be good people? Did they live good lives? Like, is there a pattern there or some of them, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, well, I do. I mean, with the big five, you know, it's, we don't have enough information for most of them to do any sort of reasonable assessment of that. As far as whether they were good people or not, um, there's quite a range. I mean, there, you know, if you're more likely to have died violently, if that life is remembered, there are plenty of people who die violently through no fault of their own, but there are others who, you know, are involved in knife fights or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So some of the people have been fairly nasty people who did some fairly nasty things, uh, but then there are other people who are, you know, just kind of typical good people doing their best. Well, that's that's really important information in itself. I mean, you're, you're basically, you know, they're, what if they're like listeners who are saying like, I want to increase the chances that like some five-year-old remembers my life, you know, <laughs> for two years. Yeah. That's all we get. But, but there's another part of this that's a bit disappointing, right? Like with the reincarnation stuff is like, what, what, were you, what are you saying? Like the best extension we get is some you know, annoying four-year-old, like, you know, being like, oh, I'm Scott Barry Kaufman, you know, and then it's like, no one believes them. And then, you know, two years later, they don't remember me the rest of their life. Like, are you saying that's the best I got in terms of extending my consciousness? Well, it, it sort of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know what you're saying, but I, I, I like to view this as there may be sort of a larger self as well as the personalities that we have in each life. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, Kid comes back and remembers your life, and then by the time they're school age, they've forgotten it. Um, if there's a larger self that is part of your existence this time as well as the next time, then you hope that this larger self grows or learns or becomes more evolved, however you want to put it. You, you hope that each lifetime that there can be progress made, and you know that that is just part of our journey. My gosh. There's just so many implications, even for theories of consciousness. I'm sure you're aware of panpsychism. Yeah. I think that's the most compatible with what your theory is. Um, I my my prior guest, my my current episode that's up right now, you might want to listen to it, is with Antonio Damasio mm. on the nature of consciousness. Um, so you're going to be in a really interesting counter. <laughs> he comes at it from a very different view. Yes, he's not a big fan of panpsychism. Um, but, the, but some people are some people that I'm friends with are, um, you know, it's, I don't have a card in this horse personally. I, I want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. There's so many just deep implications of, of this, you know, and it makes you just think about how does it all tie together? What does it all mean? Now, if we, if we zoom out even further, right? Like to the universe, we zoom out, you know, is the, is the universe finite? Is the universe not finite? Uh, you know, I have this kind of, um, intuition that physicists would probably disagree with uh, this is probably not possible but i have this intuition that 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 time just keeps looping back on itself that like that we're going to like it, it'll get to some 
point of the universe, even if it's like 30 trillion years from now, they're kind of like whoops back again <laughs> because I don't, you know, like, and that I'm going to live this life again. <laughs> you know, like I, I really kind of feel that's, that's, that's the way it works. <laughs> well, and there are physicists who talk about basically new universes bubbling out of current ones where it's an infinite number of universes. And if it's truly infinite, it means that at some point there would be this same existence we have now that would be redone. Uh, so yeah, it all gets rather mind boggling. It does get mind boggling. And you can kind of see like, you know, the error, error in the system. Like maybe it's not a foolproof system. And that's what you're seeing in your cases where like it starts to like, you know, uh, it's like, whoops, we put that person's consciousness over in that person's body for a couple of years. Whoops. You know, and, I, and maybe it's not even like a, like a conscious entity that's doing it, but a process, a process. Well, that's right. And, and yeah, the, the process may get sort of short circuited sometimes, particularly with sudden uh, violent deaths where things don't go the, the way they typically do. And then you have my friend David Chalmers writing a book, Are We Living in a Simulation? And he are, he puts it as a greater than 50% probability that we are. What I'm saying is we need to tie all this stuff together and come up with like a unitary theory of, <laughs> of whatever in a, with a scientific basis. Yeah. I mean, it's just fun to even talk about. Dr. Tucker, if there are people listening to this episode who – uh, have cases of their children or or even the kids themselves who are listening to my five are listening to my podcast and they want to report this to you, what can they do? Well, they can contact us uh, through our website, uh, which is www.uva.dops, which is Division of Personality Studies, D-O-P-S dot org. Uh, or they can just Google my name and, and find us that way. But yeah, we'd love to hear from families uh, if their children are talking about a past life. Wonderful. Thank you so much for approaching uh, a taboo topic with such uh, scientific rigor. Uh, it's really it's really refreshing to see that. And thanks for, for channeling with me today on my podcast. Uh, it's been my pleasure. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.